Our next speaker is trial lawyer Kevin Baumgartner, a founding partner of Core Cronin, Mickelson, Baumgartner, Fogg, and more. That's a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> Kevin is used to jumping hurdles. He is a competitive cross-country equestrian, and Kevin has successfully jumped the hurdles in more than a dozen whistleblower cases. Um, he will describe what it takes to deal with whistleblowers in a litigation setting, what protections they have, how you can identify bogus claims, the kinds of investigations to perform when you're dealing with litigation in this arena, and how to defend company witnesses at deposition, and more in just 20 minutes. So please join me in welcoming Kevin Baumgartner. Well, thank you, and I really enjoyed uh, the panel that uh, Linda mediated, and I'm gonna take a slightly different approach in, in a couple of respects. Um, one is that I'm going to uh, not focus on government-involved uh, cases so much, uh, not focus on the FCA, more on private cases brought by individuals um, under some of the whistleblower statutes that are add-ons to a number of statutes, such as Dodd-Frank, uh, the, the Energy Reorganization Act, other statutes that you've heard about. Also, I'm going to focus on non-meritorious claims as opposed to claims uh, really giving much time to the investigation of claims that might be meritorious, because I'll tell you that in the 15 or so cases that I've, I've handled that are whistleblower cases, I've never come across a meritorious claim. I know there are some, um, I, and, and, and certainly it's important uh, to deal with compliance issues, that type of issue. But what I am dealing with generally are claims brought by people who actually have a different motivation, and how do you defend those claims? So let's get started, and we'll, we'll start with the, the prominent role of the whistleblower. This is the big picture. This is part of the problem. Society lionizes what are perceived to be whistleblowers. Modern culture, the movies, all of these people have been portrayed in the movies. Oliver Stone is coming out with the Edward Snowden movie now. So this is something that, uh, that you start kind of behind the eight ball. And here's another part of the big picture, the media. These are really the two words that you never see together. And this is important to understand because the targeted company when a whistleblower claim gets into the media is going to start behind the eight ball. And here's the proof. I mean, take one of these headlines. Take the uh, Chicago Tribune headline there on the lower left. Whistleblower files federal lawsuit against Morgan Stanley. Now, they don't know that this person's a real whistleblower. They don't say alleged whistleblower. They don't put quotes around whistleblower. Um, do you ever see a headline that says, disgruntled failing employee uh, decides to rebrand uh, his, his incompetent conduct in the past by claiming to be a whistleblower and get a big payday. You're not going to get that. So understand that that's part of the problem. And understand another thing, which is that whistleblower protection statutes are really proliferating at a, an exponential pace, really. Um, these are just a few examples. And of course, when you look at Dodd-Frank at the bottom, the finance example, I think everyone's heard about some of the just massive awards, $30 million award in one case the SEC awarded under Dodd-Frank. And one that if, you, uh, if, if you're involved in government contracting, contracting with governmental agencies, you should be aware of the NDAA. Um, that is fairly new. There's a sunset provision this year, but it's going to be reauthorized. Uh, that, and, and it's significant because it expands the statute of limitations, certain other protections. Most whistleblower uh, individual statutes have a 180-day statute of limitations. This one, it's three years um, and less stringent requirements in some respects. Another thing you should know is that the whistleblower protection laws that are added on to these various statutes that we've mentioned, they don't tend to be, these aren't normal lawsuits in the sense that you have the normal burdens of proof, the normal administrative burdens. There's a very expansive definition of what's protected activity. Often, as, as I think was mentioned by the panel, someone could be doing their job, just doing what their job duties are, and they are deemed to be a whistleblower virtually uh, or, or, or engaged in protected activity with virtually every email they send. Materiality uh, is, is seldom required. I mean, slaps on the wrist, such as a warning letter, can be enough. 
um, because they might chill the person from engaging in further whistleblowing. Very low standards of causation, contributing factor as opposed to predominant factor or the major factor. So, you know, again, you should be aware of this and also be aware that, that the administrative process, and I've done a lot there in the Department of Labor process, it's really a crapshoot who you get, the, the investigator. Well, don't, don't get me started on the investigators. I mean, some of those people from OSHA can be very difficult to deal with and really don't understand the subject matter. And then the ALJs who, from in the department and in other departments that are like this, they can really vary in terms of competence and quality. Some are quite good, some not. And again, there's, there are review boards. Uh, there's sometimes a federal circuit court review at the ultimate end. That may be five or six years down the road. And then here's something you should be aware of, and this is a very uh, classic tactic that is now done by a lot of people who file whistleblower claims. Let's say someone's terminated, he or she files a whistleblower claim, and while that claim is pending, they reapply to the same company again. And of course, for you know, all kinds of reasons, and you can imagine how this contorts how HR departments and legal departments deal with that application, you know, by not raising the fact that they've got this whistleblower claim because that would be per se another violation. You'd be retaliating against them for bringing a protected claim. And instead, you, you don't hire them for another reason, they bring another claim. And then while that cl those two claims are pending, they apply again for another job, bring another claim. And there's this fellow, it's in the materials, named Saeed Hassan, who's brought nearly 20 claims over the last 15 years uh, in the kind of the energy complex, the DOE complex world, and, and uh, you just can't stop him. The Seventh Circuit actually uh, uh, sanctioned him at one point, but he's still at it, and it's very hard to get summary judgment on those cases, so be aware of that. How do you take the air out of the whistle? First thing is that you, you need to implement a robust compliance program. We heard about that, obviously. I'm not going to be focusing on that. I'm focusing on when a claim arises. And you heard Fitz tell you, hire a trial lawyer. Do not hire you know, your ordinary counsel or someone who, who might do other types of cases. Hire a trial lawyer who has experience in this area. And you need to get turned loose early, because I'm going to tell you, it's a battle of narratives and it's who seizes the narrative first is often going to be the prevailing party. And as I said earlier, you know, a lot of these are just total nonsense. And you know what's really going on here? It, it's two things. One, and again, this was mentioned by Fitz, money, right? Money is the real story here. But there's another thing, too. Imagine someone who is, you know, who's, who's failing at a job and let's say is terminated, is demoted, doesn't get the promotion they want, basically is a disgruntled employee, what they get is positive reinforcement from what is just an amazingly complex whistleblower support group around the country. I mean, and suddenly their messianic complex that, oh, maybe I am like Edward Snowden, maybe I am, you know, this person who, maybe I'm Daniel Ellsberg, right? that kind of kicks in, and it's very hard psychologically to get, get them out of that, sometimes to the extent that you can't even settle a case when you want to settle it, because they don't want money. What they want is the constant reaffirmation that they get from the media and from these support groups. So um, you've got to be aware of what the real motivations are, and, and that affects the game plan. First, as I said, carpe diem. Many of the claim, claimants' lawyers, and this is true, I think a lot of people have seen it in, in all areas, they will ne neglect upfront preparation. They will be very good when you get toward trial and they know the pressure's on. And I think you have to take advantage of that and, and you have to focus early in, in really reframing the narrative, whose motivation you know, trials are a battle of competing narratives, and I can't emphasize enough the, the importance of grabbing onto that, working the evidence early. And that means for in-house counsel, you have to budget that. You have to be willing to budget that. You don't just sit on these cases. You do, they're going to become very, very poisonous very quickly. And part of this, and this is kind of my, my pet area, I believe this is the most neglected area 
of upfront trial preparation, which is the case language. You can lock in terminology early if you do so, and often not only your opponent, and, and sometimes the, the, uh, the witness will agree to language that is, is framed the way you want it to be framed, but opposing counsel just sit there and let you do it. And, you know, take the sexiness out of it. A, a safety concern becomes a technical issue. You can do that. You can do that early in the case. I guarantee you won't do it late in the case. And I'm a huge proponent of taking depositions of claimants early in the case. But of course, you got to do your homework first. And I, th this relates to that. The rule of 10 degrees. If, if you take off from Seattle, where I'm from, and you know two ships go 10 degrees apart across the Pacific Ocean, which is the length of your trial. One will get to Japan, one will get to Hong Kong. They will end up in very different places, but you gotta do it early. And that's what you do when you seize the language in a case. So again, gather, review, analyze the claimant's documents as early as you can. Obviously, you need, you need to preserve documents, you need a litigation hold. If the whistleblower, and I'm putting it in quotes, is still working for your company, you've got a whole different set of challenges. I'm not gonna go into those now. They, those were touched on by the panel a bit. But assuming you have someone that's left, you better cut off their access from company documents and computers right away and get on that stuff. And, and get on social media too, which often shows true motives. Social media is, is extremely important. Often you'll, you'll get some random comment that they think is no one's ever gonna see to one of their friends saying, I'm gonna retire on this. I'm gonna make a million dollars. And that's, there's that motive. So gather and review the key witnesses' documents at the outset. And you know, find out if there's a real problem. If there is, you obviously pivot and you go into a different mode. But you have to interview your key company managers and other witnesses as soon as you can. And one thing that I, this third bullet point, sub bullet point down, developing a psychological profile of the claimant. To me, that is critical because you are putting that claimant on trial. If the trial is about the company, you know, again, what Fitch said is right. Corporations are not beloved of jurors. But if, if they get a motivation of someone who's using, misusing this federal process to make money and to, to rebrand their conduct in an unfair way, they will punish that person. But, but it, you have to find out what the truth is and seize that narrative. And always videotape the claimant's deposition for this very reason. You are dealing with credibility issues. This is, that's what these cases are about. They're about, uh, a narrative you're telling, is that true? The narrative the other side is telling. And the trial lawyer must take this deposition. Again, if you're in-house counsel, demand that the person who is your lead lawyer depose the key witnesses, including the claimant. That is so important because this is trial testimony. And by the way, don't forget to um, ask about the actual elements of the claim, the technical elements of the claim. The biggest whistleblower case I ever handled, or the most dangerous one, one that was featured on the cover of, of Newsweek magazine, we won because the lawyer on the other side kind of sat there picking his nose while I asked his, his client about the, um, the elements of his claim, and his client denied all five of the technical elements of his claim existed, and, and it was thrown out the door by a Washington Superior Court and the Washington Supreme Court affirmed. So do not neglect to ask those questions, but again, this is upfront preparation. And here, here's another example of not neglecting to answer. You know, you know claimants will say the, the darndest things, right? You, you ask a question. This is a deposition that I took, an early deposition in 2003 in a whistleblower case. And so I just thought I'd say them. Well, so you're, I'd ask them, you're, you're not really saying there's any actual, you know, safety violation by the airline, are you? And he says, no. And so, so you're not claiming that Mr. Smith or any of his superiors ever did anything to compromise safety, are you? And he says, oh, no. And so, well, why the hell are we here at that point, right? And, and game over. It, summary judgment was entered based upon that testimony and some other testimony. So you need, to, you need to ask those questions. You need to be prepared to early on take on this claimant who may be basking in the attention that he or she is getting from the media and from the, the support groups, but isn't really focusing on, on what the nuts and bolts are that are needed to 
to prove the case. And summary judgment can be a very important tool for you there, if you, if you get the right judge or the right ALJ. Now, defending company witness depositions, um, this is so critical. Of course, this is lawyering 101, right? I mean, when you're on videotape in the 21st century, one bad answer isn't only going to hurt you in this case, it's going to hurt you with, with a key company witness in cases well into the future. And so again, you have to budget substantial time and money to, if it's going to be a videotape deposition, which almost all are now in important cases, you have to take the time and budget the money to, um, to make sure that, that, that you prepare this person. You, and, and for a video deposition, that means video prep, because we're all startled by how we look on tape, right? I mean, everyone has had that experience. And so many witnesses, you know, you, you beat them up about, you know, don't give anything away. And, you know, you, you know, think about your answers. And then, you know, the, the, the questioner says, what's your name? And they kind of look at the tape for a minute, and they kind of think, and then they, and you know, that's, you can't do that on video. You've got to be much more natural, and it's hard for, for witnesses who aren't professionals in, in, in this world to balance. You know, I think it would be hard for us, too, as, as someone, I think Joe Ortega mentioned that. I think it's hard for everyone, but it's hard for witnesses to balance that. And, you know, television's a cool medium, or at least it was before this election cycle, and, but I think that for, um, for juries, it's very important to maintain that, that credibility, that level of, of coolness. And a special challenge, I think people are aware of this, but I will mention it because I've, I've defended several of them, CEO depositions. Obviously, CEOs tend to be people who are extremely independent, who are very good at, um, at bluff and bluster, and who you know, deal with... Uh, uh, deal with the analysts a lot, and so they think they can kind of just work their way on their own own charm and brains through the uh, deposition. And I, I give you two words in, in rebuttal of that: Bill Gates. You know, he was the smartest person in the room, and, and David Bowie's destroyed him in that case. And and if if you don't believe that, you know, Google Dave, uh, Bill Gates and David Bowie's. And and I think that it's important to when you deal with a, a CEO to have enough support to the extent that, that it can be generated from your in-house counsel or from, um, uh, from whoever at the company to make sure that outside counsel can, can really take that person through a realistic prep. Hard to do with some people. So finally, I'll mention media strategy. Um, very important that you have all of the interested parties within the corporation involved. And, and it's also important to realize that, you know, in a battle of competing narratives, you probably can't truly win with the media. They're not interested in that. They're interested in a white hat and a black hat and throwing out inconvenient facts. But you can win at trial. And you win at trial by understanding what's realistic and achieving what's realistic with the media, with the claimant, with the depositions of your people, and maintaining credibility, credibility, credibility. My message is, these cases are very winnable. And my other message is, ride horses. <laughs> Thank you very much.